Forgiveness? I, I know all about forgiveness. Nothing is more Christian than forgiving, right? I mean, when I think of all of the ways that God has forgiven me, of course I'm gonna forgive other people. I mean, right? Hey honey, did you see Ben broke his arm? Looks bad too. Maybe if he wasn't such a jerk in high school. Actually, I'm glad you broke your arm. I hope you break the other one too. I'm not perfect, right? I mean, I mess up sometimes. So I should forgive others when they mess up too. It's just when I think about all the ways that I've offended God, I just, sorry. <laughs> You've gotta be kidding me. This guy, I, after everything that he did, he's seriously gonna text me and ask if I, the fact that he thinks that I would, I literally, he is the last person that I would ever want to talk to right now. Well, welcome to Grace this weekend. We're glad that you're with us. And we are starting this new series, Christian Atheists, that will be in for four weeks. And before I get started, let me wish a happy Mother's Day first to my own mother and to my wife and to my mother-in-law, all incredibly, incredible women who uh, make a difference in my life and in the lives of so many people I love in amazing ways. And so to all the moms, hope that you have an incredible uh, day and happy Mother's Day to you. And nothing gets a Mother's Day message started off better than talking about the NFL draft, right? Than talking about the NFL draft. Because uh, this weekend, it's not, it's not so much a special Mother's Day weekend uh, a message as it is really beginning this series and saying what we're going to talk about affects everybody, moms, Christians, non-Christians. And as we process this stuff, uh, it's important for all of us to understand it and get in our, our minds and our hearts around it. So the NFL draft was about a week and a half ago. And uh, I pay attention to the NFL draft for a lot of reasons. I'm a, a college football fan. I'm an NFL fan. And if you've gone to Grace very long at all, you know that I'm a, a diehard Cleveland Brown. Browns fan. And so I pay attention to the draft because I want to see how the Browns did. I'm not going to lie. We crushed it. It was amazing, at least on paper. Now, the reason I think that is because I know who we drafted and where they're from and what positions they play and how they're going to fit into the roster that we already had. And, and as a Browns fan, I, I own some Browns merchandise. I've been to games at the stadium. Uh, I watch, I pay attention, uh, and I root and I cheer for the Browns, which makes sense because I say I'm a follower of the Browns. Now, if I was to run into you uh, out and about and we were to run into each other in Target or something, uh, I would, and you say, hey, Keith, I want to let you know I'm a Browns fan. I said, that's awesome. And I said, how excited are you about Baker Mayfield this year? And you said, who's Baker Mayfield? And then I said, oh, okay. Um, well, what do you think about our coach being coach of the year last year? And you were like, oh, we got a new coach like that was good last year. And then I said, yeah. And, and remember how we, we won in the playoffs and we crushed the Steelers, pray Jesus. And, 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 and we beat the Steelers and you were like, we were in the playoffs. And you, you would say those things and I would think, and you would think the same exact thing. I would think they're not really a fan. They're not really a follower. They're not really connected to the Browns. I know what they're saying, but there's a gap between what they're saying and what they're doing. And while that's superficial about the Browns, that matters in all of life when we say we're about something, but then we're actually not about it with what we do. And that happens for those of us who say we're Christians. We articulate that we love Jesus, but listen to me. But our actions don't reflect we love Jesus. We say we're in. There's a profession. There is a talk. But there's not a practical living and there's not a walk. And this type of faith is incredibly, to be honest, damning to those of us who would say we're Christians and are really trying to follow and honor and love Jesus. In fact, this is the heart of what it means to be a Christian atheist. It's when your creed and your deed don't match. It's when you, you say certain things, you profess certain things, but your lifestyle, your actions, your walk, your deed does not match. And this is damaging to the credibility of Christianity. Christian atheism is the idea that I say I love Jesus, but then there are clear gaps in my life 
around Jesus. I'm not, I'm not talking about the ongoing struggle that we all have as Christians. I'm not talking about the sin that we have to keep battling that the Spirit is warring at in our lives. I'm talking about the fact that for some of us, we say we are in with Jesus, and then we just consistently choose to say, but I'm not going to do what Jesus has called me to do. And Christian atheism is all about this idea that I profess, but I don't actually perform. Not that my performance makes me a Christian, it doesn't, but that my performance shows the world that I am born again, that I am in Christ, that I know Christ, and that I am following Christ. And I, and I want to suggest to you, please consider this, I would actually say that Christian atheism has done more damage to the credibility of Christianity than atheism has. There was a quote that was in a popular song years ago from a guy named Brendan Manning that was in a DC talk song. Years ago when I was growing up and the quote said this, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. It undermines the credibility and power of the Christian faith when those of us who say we're Christians don't live like Christians. And the Bible speaks of this. You, you don't need to, to go there, but you can write down this Bible verse. This is in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, and it says these words in this verse. They claim to know God, but their actions, but by their actions, they deny him. They claim to know God. They profess. They have a creed, which is the commitments to say this is what it means to be a Christian. They say, they creed that Jesus is real, but they deny him. And then look what it says about these people. These people professing Christians who don't live like it are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Ugh. Yikes, man, that is not good. Imagine putting that on your Facebook profile. I am a Christian atheist, and according to the Bible, I am detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. This is what the Bible refers to as a form of godliness that lacks the power of God. It's not real. And so over the course of this series, personally and corporately, we've got to consider this and wrestle with this and say, where is there a gap between my talk and my walk, between my creed and my deed, and what is actually happening with my life? Listen, listen Jesus never said, who doesn't want to go to hell? Jesus said, who wants to follow me? And following him means that there are, are real things where he's asking you to say, get in line with what it means to look like me and honor me and to glorify me. So here's, here's a question that I just want to put in front of us over the course of this series. And obviously this is a question for Christians, all right? Here's, here's the question I want you to wrestle with. Where is the profession and practice of my faith not in line with the Bible? If I would say I'm a Christian and I want to avoid being a Christian atheist, and I want to line up with what the scriptures would say about what it means to follow Jesus, where is the profession, my creed, not even where it's supposed to be? Where did I not even know I was supposed to say that and, and be committed to that as a Christian? And then where is there a gap in the practice of my faith in connection to the Bible? Where is it true that if I'm honest, I'm living like a Christian atheist, either in my profession or in my practice, or both. So over the course of the next few weeks, we want to think about what are some ways that this commonly shows up and how do we let the word of God speak to us very directly. I don't know if you've ever had this uh, responsibility or opportunity, but I've had it in different times in my life where I've been put in charge of like guarding a door to let people into a space uh, in various environments. And so they need to have a ticket or they need to wait till the lights come on or they need to wait till the lights go off or they need to wait for these few minutes or whatever it is. In fact, this happens across our church at our campuses where we open doors at a certain time and then we shut doors at a certain time and we say you can't come in till then. Maybe it's on an opener at a special series or whatever it is. And, and, and here's what I know. Whenever you work the door, you find out every person thinks they're the exception to the rule at the door. I, I, know, I know what the sign says, Keith. I know what the sign says, but I'm just like a minute late and I have a friend saving me a seat. I'll be quiet. Like I'll be, shh, You won't even see me. I just had to go to the restroom really fast. I'm actually not late. It's fine. Just, just trust me. Just let me, let me go in. 
It's a just a stupid rule. Why do you guys even have this rule? It's a dumb rule. Why do you have to have that rule? I know it's Broadway and the doors are shut and you're supposed to be on time and they said, but, but I won't disrupt the singers. I really like the show Wicked anyways. It's good. I'm going to be great. Or you look at people and you're like, don't you know who I am? Let me in the door. But here's what you know if you've ever worked at a, a carnival or a game or an event where you've had it. Everybody wants to tell you the story why the rules don't apply to them. In fact, one of the things I've learned about myself and one of the things I know about you and I just see about people, Christian or non-Christian, is that we all have this habit, this practice, and here's what it is. We are experts at being the exception. I know the rule applies to everyone but me. <laughs> all of us who are who our parents know this with our kids. I know, I know the rule about homework. I know the rule about curfew. But come on, I, I'm, I'm a good student and the rule doesn't apply to me, mom and dad. I know the rule applies to everybody else on the team with that workout, but look how strong I already am. I know everybody else at the office is supposed to turn it in and do it this way, but that doesn't apply to me. I know, I know that everyone is supposed to do it that way, but, but I'm the exception. That might not be a big deal when you're trying to come into church in a different door, and it might not be that even big a deal at home. But this is a really big deal when the Lord lays out certain guidance for us. When the Bible shows up and it says, hey, to be a Christian, to follow me, this is what you are to do. And I'm just going to bring up one this weekend where oftentimes we see Christian atheism show up and it's a command that God gives us throughout the scriptures and it shows up very plainly and it's when it shows up and it says something like this forgive as the Lord forgave you forgive as the Lord forgave you it says this in Colossians it says it in Ephesians it even says in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. It says it throughout the Bible over and over that we are to forgive. We're to forgive in the same way that the Lord has forgiven us. Quickly, completely, totally, without question, even knowing they might fail again. We're to forgive over and over. And you would even go, I know, Keith, you're probably going to remind me that Jesus died for me in the cross and it's like central to our faith and that's where forgiveness is and so I'm supposed to forgive. And then if we were to go have coffee or we were to sit down and we would have a conversation, you would go, Keith, I, I know this is true. I know it like it's supposed to apply, but let me tell you my story. And you would talk about how you're the exception. And you would start and you would say, Keith, Keith, I know, I know, forgive, forgive, and normally I'm good with that. And then you'd say this, but they did this to me. But they did. And you'd tell me about your boss, and you'd tell me about your ex-husband, and you'd tell me about your one rebellious kid, and you'd tell me about your friend, and you'd tell me about your coworker, and you'd tell me about your mom, and you'd tell me, and you'd say, I know, I know, forgive as the Lord forgave, but they... And what you would basically say at the end of that story is, I know I'm supposed to forgive, but I'm not gonna. Because I'm the exception. The story is the exception. This moment is the exception. And there would suddenly be a gap between your creed, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and your deed, what you actually do. In fact, here's how Christian atheism shows up in our lives. It shows up like this. I say I'm a Christian, but because of but they and what they did, I don't have to forgive. I don't have to forgive, Keith. It was that bad. It was that awful. It was that heinous. Now I recognize... I recognize that Grace is a big church with lots of human experience about things that have happened to people. And I, I don't want to at any point in this weekend downplay very awful, incredibly disgusting, significant things that happened to us. I, I know that there are, are people in our church that have been abused. 
I know there are situations where people have done illegal things, like committed crimes against you. I know that there are people who have been neglected in awful ways. I know that there are people who have been put in danger by other people. And so I do know that even biblically speaking, there are exceptions. There are moments where we have to deal with what this means. And and the Bible would say we always have to forgive, but we don't always have to go chase the person. And this weekend, I want to talk through how this plays out. And listen to me, it plays out the way I'm going to talk about this weekend most of the time. But I I do know there are some moments where people have had incredibly, incredibly awful and painful things. And I want you to know, not only do I see that, does our church see that? God sees that. Okay? So please know that. Please know if you are someone that has been taken advantage of in a terrible way. I get it. I do. But I am talking to the majority of us, the majority of the time, who even in normal situations, we look for the exception and we say, but because of but they and what they did, I'm not going to forgive. And we as Christians have to recognize that this is not the spirit and attitude of Christ. It's not what it means to be Christian. In fact, over the course of this week, I was looking back at how many times to this church I have preached on forgiveness in my almost 17 years, and it's a lot. I mean, we we, we talked about it in the love series where we said love keeps no record of wrongs. We talked about it in the citizen series. We talked about it in the series on the Apostles' Creed over the course of the last few summers. We've talked about it many, many times that this is the call of God in your life. And so you've heard it. You know it. You can read it. It is your creed. So the question is, why are you so often like me that you say in the but they moment, I'm not going to forgive? And I think I, think I know what's at the heart of it. You, you wouldn't say it this way, but, but here's what it's true. In those moments, what you want to do is you want to be God. And so here's what happens, okay? You believe that you have justification to administer justice in this situation. You believe that you get to do what you want to do because you're the exception and it happened and it's terrible and but they, so you get to be judge and jury and executioner and you get to play. I know God is good. I know God's the lawgiver. I know God's just. I know I'm supposed to trust him, but God, I got this one. And I'm a fellow sinner talking to a bunch of sinners going, I get it, it's real. People that I have loved have messed me over and it is hard. People I've invested in have hurt me and betrayed me. And in those moments, I'm like, God, I'll be God. I'm good, I got it. I will administer justice. And God's like, no, forgive as the Lord forgave. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But this time, I got it. Because of but they, it's an exception. I'll take care of it. It doesn't matter what we say in those moments. It matters what we do. So what I want to talk about is how should we really act when people hurt us? Sure, we should forgive. But what really does the scripture say should be our heart and our posture and our practice in those incredibly difficult moments so that we don't behave like Christian atheists, but we behave like Christians? If you've got a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Romans, Romans chapter 12. And in this particular part of scripture... Paul, the author, through the power of the Holy Spirit of God, is writing to the church in Rome about how to live out their faith. He spent a bunch of chapters reminding them who Jesus is and what sin is and how you follow Christ. And then he's really moved in the last few parts of this letter to how do you live for Jesus. In fact, he begins this chapter saying, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In fact, what I'm about to show you in scripture this week is incredibly countercultural. In fact, it's not only countercultural, I would argue it's counter a lot of counseling people get. But it's Christian. And Paul's been walking them through in the verses before what we're about to look at, how we should bless those who persecute us. How we shouldn't be conceited, how we should be humble and go 
to a low place in the way we think of ourselves and the way we treat others. And here's what he says in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 17, just right off the jump. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. And this is hard. I know, they hurt you. It was awful, it was wrong, it was evil, it was heinous. But don't repay anyone evil for evil. I feel like I say this in my house once a day to my kids. Because you know what they say? Yeah, but, but they, my brother, but my sister, but the twins, but you, mom, but you, dad. And I sort of jokingly say to them, I forgot the part in the Bible where it says, where they do wrong to you, you get to do wrong back. And then I'll quote this to them. And by the way, I don't quote this to them because I'm a pastor. I quote this to them because I'm a Christian. And I say, no, 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 no. We don't repay evil for evil. And then he continues, Paul does, and he says this, be careful what, to do what is right in the eyes. Oh my gosh, this is so hard of everyone. Yeah, that boss. Yeah, that uncle, yeah, that brother-in-law, yeah, that, that dad who was terrible to you, yeah, that, that ex, yes, do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And then he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, to the ability that you can control it, live at peace with, here it is again, everyone. You're like, I don't want to live at peace with them. Right. This is why this is Christian. This is why this is different, because Paul says, I get it, but if you want to show them the glory of God and you want to do what's ultimately best for them, you go and you pursue peace. They might not want it, but as far as it depends on you, you go try and make it right. And then Paul goes, and I know what's in your heart. I know what you really want to do in that moment, but don't do that. In fact, here's what he says as he continues. He says, don't take revenge. What you want to try to do is you want to try to get even. My dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written. And then he quotes some scripture. It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. You want to try and take revenge. You want to try and get back at them. And he says, no, 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 let God deal with it. Just, just so you know this, we don't want to think about this sometimes, but God's way better at wrath than you are. God's way better at judgment than you are. God's way better at justice than you are. God is way better at judging than you are. So he says, let God do it. In fact, he says, on the contrary, do something different. And here's what he's gonna tell us on the other side of it, ready? If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Oh my gosh, you're like Keith. Not only do I not get to punch him, now I gotta feed him. I didn't wanna come to church this weekend and hear this. Some of you are like, no, 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 Keith, it's painful, and they did it, and I don't want to forgive, and I don't want to do it, and I certainly don't want to take them to go get food. And he says, when you do this, when you feed them, when you make sure that you care for them, he says, it's like you heap burning coals on their head. You're like, I like that part. What's that mean? <laughs> well, actually, what that means is, is <laughs> this is crazy. It's a, it's a metaphor for him saying that you would be so gracious to people that people's kind of brains would be fried and they would be confused because you're so kind to them, they don't get why you're being so kind to them. You ever have that happen where you're like mean to a person and they keep being nice to you back and you're like, why won't they be mean back? And he's like, yeah, what you should do is you should be so nice to them that it heaps burning coals in their head, which is they look and scratch their head and go, why do they keep doing this? In fact, he just puts a cherry on it and he says this at the end of it. So don't be overcome by evil, but rather overcome evil with good. Do we not, I mean, it, just imagine what this would actually be like if we got after this. Do you see how counter-cultural, do you see how people who don't believe in Jesus would say this is dumb? But he says, in the moment, this is what Christians choose to do. So here's what happens. You're going to wrong people. People are going to wrong you. And when they wrong you, you're going to have to make a choice. And in the but they moments, this is what I want to call you to do. This is what it means to live as a Christian and not be a Christian atheist. In that moment, here's what you need to do. You just need to say this. You be Christian and let God be God. You just be Christian and let God be God. 
I know what they did. I know it. But you just say, in this moment, I'll be Christian and I'll trust that God is God. So I'll forgive. I'll initiate. I'll pursue. I'll love. The Bible would say as Christians, we are peacemakers. The Bible says that even when people hurt us, we love our enemies. Luke 6, he says, what good is it if we just love those who are good to us? Even people who don't know God do that. But the Christian not only loves their enemy, they pray for their enemy. They bless their enemy. Man, I know the family member, the friend, the coworker, the colleague, they did it. But you just be Christian. And then you trust God to be God. You trust God's character. You trust God's judgment. You trust God's holiness. You trust his DNA. You turn the other cheek. You wait. You love. You forgive. You believe that God's way is better than yours, and you choose it. You just be Christian, and you let God be God. Now, here's the thing, Christian. Listen to me. Isn't what you want like deep down in your soul is the ability to tell that person about Jesus anyways? Like if you're really living for the Lord, what you want and what I want is the opportunity to witness, to tell people about how good God is. Could I suggest to you that the best way to create space and opportunity to tell God, to tell people about how good God is, is that in the most difficult moments of when they treat you the worst, to be the most Christian, In fact, if you're willing to to be honest and and honor God in those moments, your good deeds will produce goodwill that will allow you to share the good news. In fact, I want to say it to you this way, that within relationships, kingdom behavior will reveal the king. That if you'll choose to have the ethics of Christ in his word, and you'll live out what it is you're supposed to do in that moment. You'll heap the coals upon their head. They'll be scratching their head. They'll say, I don't understand it. Why are they not behaving in the way that everybody else behaves? And you'll actually show them the king through your kingdom behavior. Don't obscure God's divinity through your disobedience. But in the moment, say, no, I'm going to reveal the king with kingdom behavior The glory of God, the good of others, and even your own soul rests on this. Friends, listen to me. Biblical forgiveness makes the faith beautiful. It does. It makes it attractive. We live in a world that holds grudges and will not get right with people quickly and slanders. And as fast as we build them up, we tear them down. That's not the way of Christ. The way of the Christian is to keep saying, I want you to see the king. I want you to see the king. And I will do that through kingdom behavior. My creed and my deed will match. So in this moment, I will be Christian. And I will let God be God. If you look at what Paul said in Romans, he gives us a few things to hang our hat on on how to be Christian. So I want to work through these. Number one. He says, if we're going to be Christian, we're going to have to fight for the relationship. Now, again, I recognize some people, people who are in danger, abuse, things that where even the scriptures would say, you're living in the exception. This is not talking to you, but the majority of us, the majority of the time, we're not the exception. It's talking to us, and it says, fight for the relationship. And you're like, Keith, I don't want to fight for the relationship. But Paul said, wherever it is possible, on your end, pursue peace. Try to live right with everyone. Don't return evil for evil. My oldest daughter, Kaya, plays tennis. And she's, she's pretty good. And most of the time she plays singles, but every so often she has to play doubles. And she likes singles better because she gets to control everything in singles. So if she wins, she kind of gets all the credit. If she loses, she knows it's on her. So whenever she plays doubles, we always have to have this conversation because she'll be like, they could mess up, they could mess up. And I'll say, Kaya, just control what you can control. Get your serves in. Hit your shots. You talk. 
You be a good, a good teammate. You communicate. You do whatever you can to make sure as a team you win. You can't control them, but you can control you. Do you hear what I'm saying? You can't control them, but you can control you. So you do everything you can to set it up for that relationship to win. You fight for the relationship. So you send the text first. You own everything you can and even more if you have to. You go and you say you're sorry first. You reach out to them to connect. You take them to lunch. You fight for the relationship. Why? Because wherever it's possible and it's up to you, you pursue peace. They might not want it. That's not on you. But you do what you can. Why? Because that's what it means to be Christian. There's a brand of of counseling and advice in our world that says, if people cause you pain, run away. That is not the Christian way. Again, I'm not talking about abuse, but we leave churches and small groups and friendships and jobs because we will not fight for relationships that we are called by God to fight for. Why? Because we're Christians and we don't just bail when they wrong us. We go back and fight. We go back and step into it and say, how can I make this right? We be Christian and we let God be God. You absorb it and you step into it in every way that you can. You fight for the relationship. And not only do you fight for the relationship, but number two, Paul would say this. He would say, avoid trying to get even. Again, don't pursue revenge. Don't pursue revenge. Don't repay evil for evil. God will fill that space. God says he will be the one who will bring vengeance. He will take care of it. He will step in. But we all have a natural tendency that when someone hurts us, we want to hurt them back. I was playing soccer in the backyard with Cooper not long ago and uh, was messing with him because that's what I do and I'm his dad and I'm allowed And so he was coming at me and I decided I was going to do this move where I flicked it over his head and then chased it around him and went and scored the goal. So he's running at me and I go to flick it and I flick it up and it drills him right in the face. You guys said, oh, I laughed. I didn't really laugh. And he, he, oh, dad, you ruined my day. Then he went, he picked up the ball and he tried to chuck it at me. And you know why he went to chuck it at me? You know why? Because he was trying to get even. Because I hurt him. And the natural tendency is to say, I will hurt them back. It's cute because he's six and because I was being obnoxious. It's not cute when you're 45 and it's another adult. It's not cute when it's your mom. It's not cute when it's your dad. It's not cute when it's your spouse. It's not cute when it's an unchristian, a non-Christian you're trying to show Jesus to. And what we all have to say is in that moment, I will be Christian and I'll let God be God, which means I won't try to get even. I know they're speaking condescendingly to me. I'm not gonna speak condescendingly back. I know they've broken off all communication with me. I, I'm not gonna do that. I'll continue to communicate. I know she's giving me the cold shoulder because of what happened around the dinner table, but I'm not going to give the cold shoulder back. I I know the coworker always takes credit and is a jerk, and I want to reach out and I want to sabotage them, but I won't do that because in this situation, I'll be Christian, and I'll let God be God. Can we also just be honest? We don't ever actually get even. The harder we work at it, the more we put ourselves in prison. The more it bothers us, the more we struggle. Rather than we just trust God to do what God's going to do. I believe it was Michelle Obama who said, when they go low, we go high. When they go low, we go high. When they hurt us, we don't, we don't seek revenge. Now just pause. I'm just going to say something just because I need to say it. Some of you, what's so interesting right now is you're more frustrated I quoted Michelle Obama than you are that I, I'm talking about something that's true. <laughs> you know how I know that? Because some of us don't believe we can learn things from people that we disagree with. And that's so dangerous. Because she's right. She's right. 
When people hurt you, you don't go low and get in the mud with them. You go high. You honor God. Because in those moments, what you choose to do is you say, I'll be Christian and I'll let God be God. So you pursue the relationship. Because where it's possible, you look to make it right. And then you step in and say, I'll avoid trying to get even. So I'll forgive, I'll initiate, I'll pursue, I'll love, I'll be Christian. So my creed and deed match. And then thirdly, and this is just, if it's not hard enough already, he says this, then we got to choose to bless. Remember what he said? He said, take them to get lunch, take them to get a Gatorade. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. They're hungry, allow them to eat. This is what perplexes them. This is what puts heaping coals on their head is when we show up and we do the good thing. We choose to bless. We pray. We hope for them. We want them to win. I was in North Carolina with a friend of mine who's a pastor of a really large church, and we were going to lunch. And I've been to lunch with him several times in North Carolina. And when he goes out around his church, he always runs into people that he knows. So that's really normal. So we were going into the restaurant, and we walked past this table And he said, hey, so-and-so, and And I don't remember the person's name, but I could tell by the way the person said hello back to them that they weren't real happy to see my friend. So we sat down at the table, and I said, that person wasn't happy to see you. What's that about? He said, well, there's a ministry story there. I said, really, what happened? He said, well, that guy was actually on my staff. He was a pastor on my staff. And he did something really awful, and I had to fire him. And he said, when I fired him, Uh, He just went crazy on social media talking bad about me. Spreading lies, saying these things, talking in ways that were really unfair. It created quite a mess. It was really, really difficult. And then we went on, we ate our food. We were getting ready to get our check and he asked for the check. And then he said, hey, hey, can you also bring me the check of that table over there? And he pointed to the table with the guy who used to be on staff. He said, I'm gonna buy his lunch. You know what my friend was saying? I won't return evil for evil. I'll overcome evil with good. I'll bless. I know they hurt me. I know it was public. I know what they did was wrong. So what? I'll be Christian and I'll let God be God. I know they, I know they don't pay their side of the child support stuff, but I'm going to go extra with mine. I'm going to even buy them a Christmas present because I'll bless. I'll do more on my end. My neighbor who's rude and not nice and doesn't cut their grass and lets their dog poop in my yard, I'll still go and I'll help them rake their leaves. Why? Because I'll bless. I'll find ways with people who have wounded me, my my father or my mother who, who wasn't a great parent, but now they're in need. And I'll help them. Why? Because I will choose to bless because that's what it means to be Christian. And I'll be Christian and I'll just let God be God. The scripture shows up and it says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And you say, Keith, but they, and you think you're the exception. And when you're the exception, you don't have to forgive anymore. And because you don't have to forgive, you'll administer justice the way you want. And Paul says, nope. You be Christian, let God be God. You pursue the relationship. You avoid trying to get even and you choose to bless. Now, this is incredibly, incredibly difficult. I want to give you a simple cheat code that's not in this passage, but it's in scripture all over the place. Something that I've learned has helped me slowly get better at this in my life, and it's this, that you need to become intimately aware with your own sin. The Bible would say that when you're aware of your own sin, it makes you humble, which makes you quicker to forgive because you know how often you need to be forgiven. There's like a Bible verse that says this very clearly where it talks about don't go to a person when they have a speck in their eye when you have a log in yours. You want want to become a better spouse? Become aware of all the ways you're terrible as a spouse. And what you'll find is that when you want to judge them and you don't want to forgive your spouse, you'll know, you know what? I need forgiveness all the time. And you'll be way more patient, way more kind, way more forgiving, less likely to get even. So just become an expert at what you're terrible at. It will humble you. It will shape you. 
And it will make you in those moments go, I'll be more Christian and let God be God. Because you know what you're hoping for? You're hoping in those moments they'll be Christian to you. Even with this, even with understanding Paul, what I just know is that this is impossible without the power of God in your life. It's just anti not only our culture, it's anti our own flesh. And so here, here, here's the real thing if you're just going to be honest about being a forgiving, relationship, peacemaking person who loves enemies in difficult situations. And here's the bottom line. The key to living like Christ is knowing Christ. You need the Holy Spirit You need the example and power of Jesus. You need to be born again. So here's what I'll tell you is it's really hard to live like a Christian if you're not first a Christian. So if you want to be able to really do this, you got to make sure that you've received the Lord, that you're trying to walk with Jesus, you're trying to follow Jesus. And then those of us who are Christians, we need to keep fellowshipping with him, communing with him, knowing him, understanding him, looking at his example, looking at when Jesus is being crucified. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. See how Jesus pursues peace with us. How he initiates. How he doesn't get even. How he chooses to bless. We have to keep pursuing the Lord so the Lord can change us to be able to do this because we can't do it on our own. So you say, I don't want to be a Christian atheist. I want to be a Christian. I want to live like a Christian. I want my creed and deed to match. Well, here's your homework assignment this weekend, all right? I want you to fill in the name of a person that you're struggling with and just say the choice, I will be Christian too. And for some of you, that's going to be a hard blank to fill in because you don't want to be Christian to them. And I would get it. It hurt you. It's real. But you would choose to say, I'll be Christian and I'll let God be God. And so I'm committed this week to I will be Christian too. Fill in that name for the glory of God and for the betterment of them and yourself. When I was uh, maybe middle school, I think the commercial of all commercials of my childhood came out. And it was the Gatorade commercial with Michael Jordan that said, be like Mike. And that commercial hit and it was my basketball idol. And he was like a person, but he was Michael. And he was drinking the Gatorade and the music was fly and the shorts were banging and he had the swag and the tongue out and he's balling and he's doing his thing and you're looking at it and every young baller in the world looked and said, I want to be like Mike. And that commercial just had a way of bringing us in to say, man, I wanna do what it is that he does. The commercial of all commercials for what it means to be a Christian is the cross. It's at the cross where you see God saying, I know, but they ignored me their entire college. But they are addicted to pornography. But they rejected being the father they were supposed to be. But they ignored me. But they chose greed over generosity. But they, but they, but they. And God said, yeah, but while they were sinners, I will die for them. I will pursue them. I won't won't lightning bolt them. I'll die for them. I will bless them. I will give them what they don't deserve. And it's at the cross that we see as Christians that if we're going to be Christian and we're going to imitate Jesus and we're going to follow Jesus in those moments to be a Christian, we have to say, I will live like Christ. So I'll be Christian and I'll let God be God. And I get it. In that moment, you feel like you have every right to pursue justice, but that is Christian atheism. But to be a Christian is to say, I'll forgive as the Lord forgave me. I'll be what it is Jesus wants me to be. Let's pray together. 
Father, I recognize the immense amount of difficulty it is to be a human and to forgive and make peace with those who have hurt us. But you're the example. You've chased us. You didn't get even. You blessed us. You've modeled to us what it means to be godly. So Spirit, give us the ability in those moments to choose to say, I'll be Christian and I'll let you be you. Allow non-Christians to see the hope of Jesus and how countercultural and beautiful it is that a God would choose to want relationship with the very creatures who have rejected him. I pray, God, that even this week there'd be fruit and a healing of relationships in a way that would honor you because we've just chosen to do what you've called us to do. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen.